Warframe's lore and its history at times paints a very dark and disturbing picture of the galaxy that we play in, that world of Warframe. From wars, biological weapons, abductions, mutations and other horrors, there's many dark and messed up things within the game. Sylvanas transferring herself into the Silver Grove, Valkyr's torture and experimentation, Arlo being kind of ripped apart from within, the madness suffered by the adults on the Zaraman 10 Zero, especially with Rel and his mother, and then Rel being trapped for all of that time with the man in the wall, only for it to end the way it did. Some of the lore is indeed twisted, so let's talk a little bit about some of it. When it comes to disturbing, you only have to look at the Orokin race to understand exactly what I mean. Nihil was an Orokin judge who would imprison people in glass, people that the Council of Seven deemed to have broken their precious Orokin laws, literally sucking their souls up and imprisoning them in glass. They chose this sentence simply because they seen it as the worst possible form of punishment. They would then alter your identity and turn you into a Cephalon inside your glass prison with no body and a fractured memory or having a completely altered personality instead like they did with Orden Karras by turning him into Ordus. One of the most powerful characters in Warframe's lore is now also one of the most annoying. Abductions and slavery also play a prominent role in Orokin culture. Back before the old war they had reached near immortality, seeing themselves as higher beings or gods, seeing themselves as being too good for death's cold embrace and surrounding themselves in luxury, they found a way to live forever. But the way they achieve this is genuinely horrible. They did so through continuity, the drinking of the red kuva. But when their old frail bodies were at the end of its lifespan, they would then send their consciousness into another younger body, a host body. And in doing so, this would break the child's mind and erase it from existence. So only their mind was left inside this newer, younger host body, which kind of alludes to some kind of brief sharing of that young body until the Orokin's mind destroys the younger one. Now, these younger hosts, according to the lore of the Sands of Time quest for Inros, were more often than not children abducted from outer colonies and forced into these rituals, paraded before old frail Orokin like cattle at a market before being chosen. The Yuvan Tether is mentioned as the place where the old Orokin went to trade or barter for these new younger and exotic bodies, a slave market where young bodies were paraded around literally like clothing to be worn. They marked it as a festival or celebration, a celebration of changing from one body to another, something that Teshin has also mentioned briefly in the past. A Yuvan theater long abandoned. In ages past, I would have stood guard as the young and exotic were paraded through the mountain pass and marched by the viewing pane. They'd barter here, the Oregon withering and coughing as they prepared for their continuity. So slave trading, mind breaking and wiping a child from existence is just one thing that opens our eyes to the horrors within the Orokin. Orden Karras, like I've already mentioned, was one of the most powerful warriors in the Orokin era, the Beast of Bones, and he spoke about the genocides that he had created in the name of the Orokin as well. So he has a lot of bodies, or the Orokin have a lot of bodies at their feet. But I want to do a video on him alone. I'm not going to touch Orden Karras in this video, so I'm just going to move along. As I said, the Orokin drank the Red Kuva for immortality, but there is a second type of Kuva, the Transference kind, the blue one. We found out about this during the Nabarus Halloween event. Grandmother told us a story, a story about three Orokin who thought it would be funny to kidnap and kill some Ostrons and then wear their bodies as skin suits by drinking the blue kuva. This would allow them to temporarily transfer their consciousness from their Orokin bodies into the dead, broken and twisted Ostron bodies and then run around scaring people with their new skin suits but I feel like Grandmother does a much better job at telling this story. It is also creepy as all hell, so I'm just gonna let it play. Would you like to hear a story for Navarus? One that I told my grandchildren when they were small. Very well. Long ago, in the Oricon days, a golden people lived in spoiled luxury. 
If a body wore out, why? They would take a new one as easily as plucking a maprico. Such was the mystery of the Kuva. So, what became of death and disease? Oh, they were abundant, but not for the Orokin. They were above petty death. Such was their contempt that they decreed a special day on which to make fun of it. On Navarus, the night of memory, the Shining People laughed at death. <laughs> they dressed in costumes that recalled the old days of mortality. Skulls grinned, hallways guttered with demon lights. For one night, beauty was banished. Rot and monstrosity held sway. Now, on one very special Nabarus, three pretty Orokin were bored, as Orokin so often were. Nabarus no longer holds its magic for me, sighed one. Masks and costumes are for children, grumbled another. Why follow the crowd, mused the third. Are we not the very elite of the elite? Ha ha! Up, my Kissingtons, my luscious loves. Send for blue coover and hot lights. I have a sport that will mend all. And in the corridor, behind a curtain, a solitary silent girl heard them and said nothing. Then the three were very wicked. For what do you think they did? Down into the streets they went, and they caught three poor Austrians and bore them back to their gilded halls. One they peeled like a fruit and decked out with glassy splinters, and his naked jaws went Chitter chatter snap. And it echoed all around. Scarlet footprints he left. Another's limbs they twisted and wrenched his neck and made a bundle of him until he scuttled upsy downsy like a horrid crab. With his sockets all empty and his stretched out nose snuffling. The third they pulled thin in hand and foot. She walked spindly-wise on long tiptoes like a spider, and her entrails hung delicately down. She whispered, split-tongued and hissing as she went. Fine costumes we've made, chortled the three Oregon. Let us now try them on and visit our friends. What shrieking there will be! Oh, our names will live forever in the court for such a prank as this! Now, the silent girl brought them their blue coover, so they could take on these twisted bodies for only a short time before returning to their own. They drank and slept and woke in their three horrid forms. Off they went, down the stairs, out the door, into the city, into the night of banners and masks and wild hilarity. Chitter-chatter-snap, scuffle-buttle, whispery-hispery. As you can imagine, there were many screams and laughs. Such cleverness, such wit. <laughs> but... In a high room of the tower, the silent girl looked at the faces of the three sleeping Oregon. She went and opened a little ivory door that she was not supposed to know about, and drew forth a flask that she would have been glassed for even looking at. A flask of crimson kuva, the scarlet seal upon continuity, permanent. And 
she tipped it down three cruel throats. With a little laugh, she went skating away, never to return. There were many screams that nabarous night, but when the sun came up, none screamed so loud as the three who found that they were trapped in the hideous bodies they themselves had fashioned forever and ever. So, listen carefully, Tenno, and beware, for you may hear them coming tonight. Whispery hispery on long stalking bones, scuttle buttle with his eyes all empty, and skinless, dripping handed, chitter chatter snap. Happy Nabarus! Then we have Warframes themselves, which are also a bit of a horror. Ballas' creation, the Frames of War. Biomechanically engineered soldiers created by Ballas and Margulis to help fight against the great sentient Hunhau in the Old War. The Orokin literally took their greatest volunteers, or not volunteers, more abductions, and polluted their skin just enough to transform them into sword steel. Into Warframes that would be controlled by Tenno to fight back against the sentients. But again, this shows that they took slaves or hostages and turned them against their will into Warframes, and not all transformations would have been successful so there was loss involved which shows just how evil the Orokin could be and I guess it's a good thing that Warframes did rise up and kill a lot of them. Now the Amalgam Alkanos, right, this is a unit within the game right now, is a sentient corpus hybrid unit. This thing used to be a corpus crewman, which makes it so much worse when you see them in action. They will grab another unit, corpus crewman included, lift them up into the air as the unit flails around in agony and then they will inject stimulants into its brain. But in doing so, it will melt the face off that corpus unit, leaving behind a powerful enhanced red skull corpus that just simply wants to mess you up and is a little bit harder to kill. So consider that next time you see one of these floating around, kill it before you have to witness this. Now the Orokin weren't the only ones big into slavery. Fortuna is a death ridden slave colony where people have their brains removed and shelved if Nefanyu doesn't reach his quotas or doesn't like what he sees. It is a bit of an eye opener, their brains are basically left on a shelf until someone else can pay off their debts and a lot of their bodies are heavily augmented as a result of this as well. Now, the man in the wall, the indifference or the lidless eye, three names of the same entity, an entity that we know very little about, just kind of bread crumbs being left around for us and we have to do a lot of guesswork is obviously one of the more freaky parts of Warframe's lore. His interactions with Albrecht and Trati and his description is eerie to say the least and confusing at the same time. Did he come back through the portal with Albrecht or instead of him or not? We're kind of left wondering. Rel sacrificing himself to hold back the man in the wall is another dark twisted story that paints the man in the wall as something that we should be afraid of and then it shows up in the new war and we make a deal with it. He's after something, he's not finished with us yet and we don't know what it is. We won't know I guess until the story evolves a little bit further. But it is definitely one pathway that I can't wait to go down and see what happens. It's going to be messed up and it's going to be confusing but I can't wait. Share your thoughts in the comments section below on what other dark or disturbing parts of Warframe's gameplay, units or lore there is that you'd like to talk about. Have a great day and as always, thanks for watching.